The sun shone brightly as I arrived at the base of Mount Barney. Coming in at 1,359 metres above sea level, I was about to attempt a hike on Queensland's fourth largest mountain, arguably one of the state's most difficult and dangerous. The signs at the beginning of the trail warned of the treacherous and unforgiving climb that lay ahead, on a mountain that has claimed many lives and from which unprepared hikers are regularly airlifted. This was not going to be a walk in the park. This was going to be a hard slog up the side of an ancient volcano. I was taking the southeast ridge trail to the summit. It wasn't long until I reached the Logan River, whose headwaters lie in the ancient rainforests nestled in between the deep valleys of Mount Barney and its siblings. Recent rainfall heralded a decent flow of fresh water, filling me with the hope that there may be more streams on my way to the top. I knew there was a creek next to the campsite where I would be staying for the night, so I packed light to avoid carrying too much weight up the mountain. I filled my bottles and I set off. The ascent began almost immediately after I crossed the river. The dense, vine-laden scrub that surrounded it eventually gave way to bushland dominated by tall gum trees bearing the scars of intense bushfires. The odd marker here and there let me know that I was travelling in the right direction, but there was little else to indicate which track was correct. Fallen trees provided convenient resting places as the day became warmer. The landscape became more and more dramatic as I continued my climb. Massive boulders were perched precariously on the hillside, rounded by tens of thousands of years of rain and wind. Barely two hours into the climb and I felt I had weathered more than the mountain, the remarkably unforgiving ascent continually slowing my pace. To make matters worse, the track was becoming harder to spot and would often jut off in confusing directions. Navigating these junctions was generally based on my theory that if I'm going up, it's the right direction.
Well, I got to go to Memphis from there to Leland. Going to see my baby about a loving, about a loving spoonful. Oh, I just got to have it, my loving. Good morning, baby. How you do this morning? Well, please, ma'am, just a loving, just a loving spoonful. Makes things all right, that loving. My baby packed a suitcase and she went away. I guess she couldn't stay for my loving, for my loving spoonful. I just got to have it, my loving. Every so often, I would reach one of the mountain's smaller peaks, after which I would have to descend some 50 metres before continuing the climb. While these short descents were a welcome reprieve from the seemingly endless scrambling, they offered little in terms of relieving the vertical punishment that lay beyond them. To make matters more strenuous, I had run out of water barely halfway up the mountain. I resorted to attempting to collect droplets that came from the rocky crevices adorning the climb, but these were of little aid. There was water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Well, I just got to have it, my loving. Good morning, baby. How you do this morning? Well, please, ma'am, just a loving, just a loving spoonful. Well, I just got to have it, my loving spoonful. After what felt like an eternity of climbing, I had finally reached the summit. As I gazed out at the countryside that lay before me, the discomfort of dehydration that had accompanied me for the past several hours was muted, replaced by a feeling of humility. I was a tiny human on top of a mountain, and the world had never felt so massive. My backpack had decided that it couldn't take the abuse anymore. Before I continued, I had to stitch it back together with rope. After that, all I could do was hope that it would hold as I began my descent to the campsite. As I descended into the valley, I heard the unmistakable trickle of running water. I had finally found the stream. Desperately thirsty, I made for the creek as fast as my weary legs could take me. I sat by the creek, still exhausted but no longer thirsty. The cool water tumbling softly over the weathered rocks was incredibly cathartic, helping to soothe my aching body. This, above all else, was what I had been searching for. I had found paradise.
dinner was a splendid affair. In normal circumstances, two tins of Heinz big and chunky butter chicken would only serve as dog food for a dog you aren't particularly fond of, but these were not normal circumstances. Cradled in my hammock with a belly full of food, I had never felt more relaxed. As the sun rose that morning, I sat on the hillside and gazed upon nature's magnificence. The frigid air blew softly across the mountain as the sun desperately tried to warm the rocks upon which I was perched. I was exhausted, but also deeply enamoured with the rocky wilderness in which I found myself. The harsh environment lended itself an oxymoronic beauty, one of calmness, but also of great peril. The silence was deafening. Quit your rambling Quit your gambling Quit staying out late On a night Just go on I made my descent along the South Ridge track. While its topography was marginally more forgiving, the trails again would split into strange directions. Faced with yet another intersection, I did not want to believe I once again had to go up. Every fibre of my being wanted to descend as fast as I could, and any ascent became counterintuitive. In a fit of puerile rage, I began to curse the mountain, blaming it for the physical agony I had brought upon myself. Thankfully, after a few hours, the track turned into a graded path. I was walking on flat land again, and it was glorious. I was near the end of my journey on Mount Barney. As I crossed the Logan River for the last time, unable to find the energy to remove my boots, I was filled with a sense of great satisfaction. This mountain had thrown in me everything in its arsenal, its unforgiving ascent and savage environment constantly beating me back as I clambered up its side. It had become anthropomorphized, a living, breathing entity desperately trying to free itself from the steely grasp of mankind. In a way, I felt guilty for adding even more footprints to this pristine ecosystem. For me, this adventure had highlighted the dire need to preserve these areas, to keep them from succumbing to the relentless destruction that we as a species inflict upon them.
above all else, this trek made me appreciate that through the agency of chance, not only was I able to climb such a treacherous and beautiful mountain, I could effortlessly retreat back to society and its comforts by simply turning a key and pressing a pedal. To have been born in such a profoundly stunning country, where wilderness and isolation is a stone's throw away from a capital city, is the greatest gift I have ever received. Home was calling, but it would have to wait just a little longer. There was one last thing I needed to do before I returned.